food was like the only place that I felt like safe to be Korean. And that's something that I didn't realize until, you know, super recently. I mean, being American and like wanting to get away from that shaped how I talk, how I dress, how I hold myself, kind of all of that. Food is more than just a means of sustenance. It's an essential part of every culture. Through food, we can express ourselves, we connect with other people through food, and we pass on heritage and culture through it. Food can be a deeply ingrained part of a person's cultural identity. Because of this, food is a big part of the travel experience. Through food, we're invited to learn about and experience local culture, heritage, and traditions. Today, we're chatting with Katie Johnson. She took to life on the road almost a decade ago and used her experiences and passion to create her travel consultancy company, as well as a podcast. Katie is the host of the Tasty Trails Travel Pod, where she talks with people from around the world and learns about their culture and traditions through the food that they eat. Hi, Katie. Hey, Erin. This is Curious Tourism, the podcast focused on making travel better for people and the planet. I'm Erin Hines, travel writer and content creator, and I'm joined by my producer, Katie Lohr. That's me. And if you enjoy the show, Erin and I would love for you to support it. And it's really easy to do so. First, double check that you're even subscribed to the show on your favorite podcast app. And then second, keep an eye out for polls and questions that we're going to be leaving on Spotify. Every episode, we'll be dropping a little nugget there so you can keep the conversation going. And we would love to hear what you think. And it'll help us make the show better. And on that note, you can also get in touch with us directly on social media or by email. All our contact info is in the show notes. And before we dive into the show today, we'd like to say thank you to Safety Wing for partnering with us to bring you this episode. All right, Katie, so before we get to the main reason that you're here, which is to talk about food, I would love to unpack some stories from the travel news sphere this month. Um, I have brought a story, and I know that you've also brought one. Um, So why don't we start with yours? What travel news story have you been thinking about lately? I just saw an article that talks about many destinations are raising tourist taxes, um, but are they accomplishing their goals? It kind of talks about like what a tourist tax is, especially I've noticed it a lot in, in Europe. Um, you usually go to your accommodation and you pay uh, an extra amount, um, and it usually depends on the city and the country. Um, and it's anywhere from like one euro 50 cents. I've seen all the way up to even like 20 euros and stuff a night per person per night. The idea, I think, behind most of this is to decrease the number of tourists and kind of um, use that money to go towards restoration and stuff like that. Um, And so, yeah, this article was talking about whether or not it's accomplishing that. And as far as climate change goes, like maybe that's not going to be super helpful, but, you know, it can take in a lot of money um, and it has been going, you know, in certain cities to restorations of things and, you know, clean up and just kind of stuff that tourists really do contribute to, um, you know, and the tourists and travelers aren't paying taxes or anything like that uh, to maintain roads and kind of all the stuff that, you know, we use when we visit places. So I do think it's an interesting concept. Yeah, I've seen it debated so much over the years because some people get really upset about the concept of a tourist tax. I personally like have never had an issue with it. I think like it's it's fair to ask visitors because like you say, like we're using resources in the places that we visit. And if we can like contribute directly to maintaining those resources, I do think that it's a good thing. But I guess it, it does boil down to like how it's being used. <laughs> that was my exact thought. <laughs> and and anytime I've paid a tourist tax, like I don't actually look at how it's being used. And it would be interesting to dig into that. Is there even a way to figure out how it's being used? Because this is my thing. Like I am all for paying taxes. But with sustainability goals, how do you actually know if your taxes in that, that country? Most, sorry, that was the most Canadian statement. I'm all about paying taxes. I am. <laughs> Happy to pay taxes. Happy to. We pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> and we pay a lot of taxes with a lot of optimism, sort of like deeply ingrained into paying those taxes. And I think especially over the last like a year or so, we're kind of like, mm, is it actually doing anything? <laughs> 
Yeah, that is a bigger question <laughs> bigger question for another this time. This is now but... the Canadian politics <laughs> podcast. Yeah. But yes, I would be curious to look into like how you can find out where the money or pain is going. Um, I also think it's interesting to bring up Bhutan. I don't know if it was mentioned in the article, but it's famously... It was. It was? Okay, because they're yeah. famously the most expensive country to go to. And that's because they charge a $200 per day tourist tax to visit. And they've argued that it's a good thing because it's kept like tourism numbers pretty low. And it's made tourism like very beneficial for them because they have like a low number of people coming, but they're still making like a lot of money off those people. But then my worry is it becomes like an elitist place to travel. Like it's not going to be accessible to most people to travel to Bhutan. Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's interesting to kind of balance those two things. And, you know, that's what happens when you start charging more money there i know venice kind of famously had the like five euro per day like only you only had to pay it if you're coming for the day and not spending the night uh because they also want to encourage people to like stay longer and stuff and that you know didn't really work it didn't discourage anybody because you know five five euros per person people who are going to, yeah it doesn't like do anything but i mean like the city still gets more money um but it wasn't really accomplishing what it set out to do yeah. I'm so curious how they were actually capturing the five euro from everyone. I actually used to live in Venice. Like I lived there for six months. Oh. Just from that perspective, like knowing the logistics of getting around that city, I'm just like, I don't know with the volume of people coming in, how they would check everyone for this, which also just makes me so curious. Like if it's just an honor system, they just say like, you ha should do this, please do it. But like, and as you say, five euro per person, I guess like when you look at the volume of people going to Venice, like throughout the summer, especially it would add up, but it's not like a large enough number to really discourage people from visiting. The article talked a lot about Greece implementing this tax. Greece is an interesting example to me because it was, it's still recovering from bankruptcy and you would kind of hope that a tourist tax, because it blew up as a, it's been a tourist des destination forever, but I remember it's definitely blown up over the last few years. I've seen a ton of people going and I had imagined that'd be good for the economy and to help people kind of recover from ba bankruptcy. So it makes sense to implement a tax in Greece. But I have no idea if that would actually help. I do. <laughs> you bring up a really interesting point that I think is super relevant to this discussion, which is that the tourism industry does benefit economies, but it only benefits certain people within those economies, like people who are adjacent or working in that industry. When I envision a tourist tax, my assumption is that like it's being used municipally or like on a federal level to benefit everyone, like as a society, that would be my assumption. And then from that argument, you could say like a tourist tax is actually a better tool because then they can like leverage that income to like benefit the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Greece is interesting because like anyone working in tourism sure is like benefiting a lot. But if you are not, you're not reaping those benefits in the same ways as other people. Wow, this is great, Katie. I think we need to do an entire episode about tourism taxes. <laughs> Write it, it down. Actually, Put it in the spreadsheet, Aaron. <laughs> My massive spreadsheet. It actually ties really well into the article that I brought because the article I brought is about the opposite, which is about countries that are seeking tourists. Um, so this is a BBC article and they highlighted four countries that are actively welcoming travelers. And I thought it was an interesting list. I was interested because I've actually been to three of these countries so I was happy to see them highlighted here. The one I haven't been to is Greenland. Very much want to go. <laughs> Everyone knows I love Iceland. So the next frontier for me is to get to Greenland. And then the other three mentioned were Morocco, Serbia, and Georgia. Have you been to any of these, Katie? Uh, I've been to just Serbia. So I thought this article was interesting because in a time that people are like flooding to these like countries that you see viral on TikTok, viral on Instagram, I think this is like a really effective way that people can sort of like redirect their travels and and go to a place that like is really asking for those tourists to come. I always find it like 
quite sad that people just like continue to go to these places that are actively saying like we don't have capacity because at the end of the day too and I think this is why I've been to so many countries on this list you end up having a better experience as a tourist yourself in these countries because they're happy to have you and they're not overwhelmed with tourists mm -hmm. so yeah I was happy to see this coverage I hope we see like more mainstream publishers like BBC bringing attention to these places because I think like the general public um, really benefits from from seeing coverage of these places. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, too, because tourism and travel is kind of a, a bell curve. Iceland had the, the huge travel campaign and Croatia had huge marketing campaigns that are now it's now suffering from over tourism and kind of the same thing that all the other places for over tourism and especially places like Greenland, which is like so much nature and kind of all that stuff. You know, I guess I'd be interested to see in the future how successful it is and if if it does kind of turn to have that problem uh, but I do love you know spreading it out and making everyone more aware because to be honest like everywhere in the world but you know besides kind of unsafe politically situations and stuff is awesome place to travel um, it's just some places have different you know marketing budgets than other places um, and you can find something amazing in kind of you know anywhere you look I'd taken a look at the the article and I did think it was interesting that some of it was encouraging like cruise ships and that I didn't like yeah. totally love because uh, that's, I think, kind of infamously, you know, not great since people are only staying for like a few hours and not really buying anything. But overall, I do think it's like great to just like raise awareness and stuff. Totally agree. It's like ironic that they did this good thing by highlighting these lesser known places, but then like threw in the cruise ships. Should I be chaotic yeah. and email the author? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, and they're talking about the uh, World Cup. Um, and so like a lot of the help was coming from a lot of the um, chain hotels. And so the money coming in is, good, is leaving immediately, or I guess it's not even coming in. You know what I mean? Like it's just going straight to the Radisson's and the, you know, the chain hotels. But as far as kind of long-term um, sustainability in tourism and hosting travelers and visitors, you know, growing your economy and stuff, uh, I don't think that's going to be particularly helpful. So I think it's also important to understand like how it's being done. Yeah. I really like your point about the bell curve too, because it's, it's just an example that we've now seen over and over again. The Iceland example is great because Iceland didn't have a lot of tourism and then they just did some really great marketing and now they have too much. And now they're shifting to trying to like redirect people to the lesser known regions. That's why when Luke and I went last week, we went to the West Fjords, which is like the least traveled region of Iceland. They have this problem of concentration where like they showed these main highlights on the south coast that were easy to access and now everyone goes there and now they have this problem of being like but wait like we're actually quite a large country there's much more to see here so you kind of like shoot yourself in your own foot if you do your marketing too well <laughs> so it does make me worried especially for Greenland because like there's a lot of like questions around conservation and like ecological yeah. preservation for a country like Greenland like there's a lot of issues I'm reading about with travel to Antarctica. And so I just worry that like, they'll just end up with the opposite problem down the road. Well, I think they just have to be instead of like, okay, this is what we need now to really like, think about it, um, and have like a longer term plan, especially with how quickly information moves these days. And you know, bringing in a whole airport is massive. Like that's going to open it up like significantly more. And so, but I mean, yeah, I always hope that it's a good thing. So yeah, it's just so hard, hard with like the virality of the internet these days, just how quickly like a place can just become viral. And then suddenly everyone is booking flights there. <laughs> Well, it's funny because Iceland is was on the list of, of countries that was implementing the tourist tax uh, mm -hmm. now because, <laughs> yeah, because it's reached that point. So maybe yeah, that's just the funny. life cycle of the future of the tourism industry, which is like spend a bunch of money bringing people over and then trying to recoup a bunch of money, <laughs> telling people yeah. to yeah. not come anymore. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting, too, about Iceland is during the pandemic, when so many countries were shut to tourism, I read an article about how they spent 
essentially two years investing money in tourism during the pandemic to build infrastructure to better support tourists. So I quote Iceland a lot because I just think they're such an interesting example of like tackling over tourism and they're clearly putting a lot of thought and like funds towards managing it. It's just interesting to see like the evolution of tourism there. Let's get into talking about food. I'm really excited to be doing this episode because I told you over messaging, Katie, this has been in my spreadsheet for probably like three years. And I have tried to get, (laughs) like actually, and we have tried to get other people on the show. There were like, I forget who, but there were a couple people we reached out to and it just like never panned out. So I was super excited when I came across your show because I was like, well, this is perfect. Like someone who loves to talk about travel and food and culture. And so, yeah, I'm really happy to have you here. Well, I'm excited to be here and very happy to oblige. (laughs) (laughs) So Katie, you host a podcast that is all about travel and food. So you're clearly very passionate about the culinary aspects of food and travel. So can you share with us your journey into food and travel? I'm curious if it's always been an important part of your life. Um, I've certainly always loved food. Uh, My nickname growing up was Tato because there was just like, at one point, I just ate an absurd amount of mashed potatoes. Uh, (laughs) And now my friend's kids call me Auntie Tato, uh, which I love. So yeah, I've kind of always been, I've always loved food and just like the experience of food and kind of everything about it. The first time I was abroad that I spent kind of a significant time abroad was in Vienna. I was introduced to like schnitzel and stuff and just kind of all the European deliciousness. I came home 15 pounds heavier. Uh, and that was like when I was a teenager in high school. So that's like actually saying something because my metabolism was, metabolism was uh, great back then. So yeah, it just kind of opened my eyes to to the world of food that wasn't kind of, you know, just Mexican or Chinese food that's pretty common in the in the U.S. Yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to spend a lot of time in Italy. And so just being around people who that is like part of their culture and they are, they're knowledgeable and respectful and passionate about food kind of made me realize like, oh, like these are my people. Like I feel this way about food and you guys are, you're talking about it in the way that like I think about it and you're eating it and celebrating it in a way that like, I love and hadn't quite seen before. And so that I think also really, I don't know, just like I kind of realized like how much I I loved food and um, just kind of, yeah, the whole experience around it. You grew up in the US, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I could be totally wrong, but I sometimes get the feeling that like in Western culture, we don't we don't like romanticize food in the same way as like other cultures do. It's hard for me to talk about this, honestly, sometimes because like I've talked about this on the show before. I talk about it on social media a lot. I have like very severe food allergies and it's really impacted like my relationship with food. It's so intriguing to me to hear you talk about how much you love food because for me, it's always been a scary thing. And like this sounds so dramatic, but like people who are close to me will tell you like food for me is like very connected to anxiety and fear of death. So it's very difficult to like love food. (laughs) this is kind of a sad story. It's not sad for me anymore. It was sad in the moment. But when we were in Korea, I just like fully cried on the street one day because I saw people like leaving a food market, just like eating. And I just was like, I would love to know that feeling to just like walk into a food market and just like eat whatever I want to eat. And I will never know that feeling because I just look at everything and think like, oh my God, did a peanut touch that? Did a peanut touch that? So it's hard for me to like have great judgment, I think, when it comes to like culture and food. But like as an observer, I feel like in the West, we just don't have the same appreciation for food. I didn't really develop one myself until I moved to like a big city like Toronto. There's a big culinary scene and I feel like my partner is very into food. So he sort of opened my eyes to that. But yeah, I'm curious like what your thoughts are as someone who grew up in the U.S. I think maybe it might have to do with North America in general being kind of a bigger melting pot and not as homogenous as uh, other places are. And so there wasn't kind of one food or culture necessarily to celebrate and lift up and highlight. Through that, I think it kind of became a more individualized 
experience. And I mean, I have no idea. Like, I have done no research on this. I, I have no idea. But uh, to me, that makes sense is just because it's so not homogen- homogenous. Certainly, there's a word for that, but I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting you bring up the, the thing about homogeneity. Is that a word? I think it is. Um, because that's something I notice, like traveling, especially in South Asia. In Nepal, for example, we always, whenever we, we met Nepalese people, we, we just thought it was fun to ask, like, what is your favorite food? Like, we would always ask this, like, whenever we met someone local in another country. And we just noticed in Nepal, every single person would say dalbat. That's like the like national dish. Like everyone eats dalbat. You eat it like at least once a day. We just thought it was like so cute that everyone would just default say like dalbat is my favorite thing. And it's fun in Nepal because like people make it in different ways. So you can try it in like different variations. But if you were to ask like a Canadian or an American, I feel like there would be no default answer. And it would probably be tied up in our like individual cultural identities as well. Yeah, for sure. I would agree with that. So what has your personal experience been around food, culture, and heritage? Did you grow up with any like defined traditions around food? And if so, did they contribute to your cultural identity? I mean, I think some like classic ones like Thanksgiving and stuff like those are just very fond memories. After Thanksgiving, the day after, so Black Friday, I would we would go cut down our Christmas tree and then I'd come home and make Uh, Christmas cookies. And I always committed to like way too many. I I had to have like four kinds of Christmas cookies. And every year I made the same mistake that it was like halfway through. I was like, I'm this is too many types. I'm too bored. Like, I don't want to do it anymore. And every year I'd kind of do the same thing, like a tradition of that. Uh, so, but I don't know. Holidays is pretty, pretty classic one. As far as like travel and stuff, we used to go on a uh, vacation to like Michigan every year. And um, we had traditions that we kind of did the same every year. And there are uh, different meals that we'd make together, or we'd go biking to our favorite like ice cream shop um, and just kind of stuff like that. We'd go bit blueberry picking. And so a lot of that like revolved around food um, that I, I don't know if I realized at the time, but looking back it, yeah it was pretty much all food related and I'd be really upset if, if we like changed a meal or like did something like that because that was uh I don't know just like a really important part of it but I think most recently is so yeah I did grow up in the states but I was born in South Korea and was adopted when I was four months old and kind of spent my whole life trying to get away from being you know Asian I just wanted to be American my the parents did take me to a Korean camp every summer. And so it was in like the suburbs of Chicago and it was for uh, Korean adoptees and their families to like learn about Korean heritage, which was like super cool. And my mom would volunteer in the kitchens. And so she would, you know, we eat Korean food at lunch every day and um, she volunteered in the kitchens and learned how to make Korean food. And so on my airplane day, which is the day that I arrived in the States, she would always bring make Korean food and bring it to share with my class. Everybody loved it. It was like a huge hit. And that was where I felt like proud to be Korean and like have that as a part of me. And uh, I did it for my graduation party as well. And it was like, yeah, I don't know. It, I realized that food was like the only place that I felt like safe to be Korean. And that's something that I didn't realize until, you know, super recently. I mean, being American and like wanting to get away from that shaped how I talk, how I dress, how I hold myself, kind of all of that. But yeah, holding that part of Koreanness, you know, going to a Korean restaurant with a friend and be like, oh, well, this is like how they do this or whatever. I would get excited to like share that part of me. And I still, that's something that I still have to work through and figure out like how that fits into me as an adult that isn't trying to run away from that necessarily anymore. Yeah, I was going to ask, what is your relationship with Korean food now? Have you been like growing it and developing it even more since childhood? Well, I'm a vegetarian now. Oh, no. So, yeah. <laughs> I know from being in Korea, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. So I eat a lot of bibimbap. So, Which is so no, good. Yeah, it is so good. It is so good. So no, but, but mostly because there's just like a lot of meat and fish. Being a vegetarian has kind of trumped, you know, expanding that. When I go back, I think maybe for like a weekend or something, I'll, I'm like I'm pretty chill. Like if there's pizza sitting around there's like pepper pepperoni and I'll just be like well I'll just like pick that off or whatever and for a f- very few culinary experiences like in Peru I took a break and for a weekend I ate ceviche uh, I will do the same in Japan uh, for sushi so every now and then but like very very rarely I'll take a I'll take a little bit of a break to kind of experience that um, and so I just have to 
you know, pick and choose where I want to do that. Um, but yeah, no. So, so no, that was a really long answer to say it hasn't, um, but not for, not for any reason other than the vegetarian part. Yeah. That's a great approach to traveling as a vegetarian, like as someone with food allergies, like I know how challenging it is to find meals that like match your restrictions. And I always think like, it's kind of funny, but I'm always like, I can't be vegetarian because I already have too many restrictions. Like I can't yeah. throw another one in the mix. <laughs> and then I'm like, why would you choose that? But like, I get it. I fully support vegetarianism. And everyone always thinks that I am vegetarian because like, I think I give vegetarian <laughs> energy because people always assume that I am and I have like dabbled with it like it's doable at home but when we're traveling it's just like I just have to eat what isn't gonna kill me If you're a remote worker or a digital nomad, then you know how important it is to stay safe while country hopping. I know from my own full-time travels that things can and often do go wrong, and in moments like that, it's important to have support. Safety Wing offers travel medical insurance that's specifically designed for the needs of freelancers, remote workers, and digital nomads, no matter where in the world you are. They're on a mission to create a global social safety net for everyone. With Safety Wing, you're covered all over the world with one policy. It's a monthly subscription, so your coverage is continuous and you can turn it off at any time. Recently, Safety Wing launched a new version of their Nomad Insurance, which has a $0 deductible and a new claim process that takes less than five minutes to fill in. Already traveling? Not a problem. You can buy a Safety Wing travel medical insurance policy, even if you've already left your home country. If Safety Wing sounds like it'd be right for you and your adventures, check out the link in our show notes. So yeah, unfortunately, my food allergies, like I mentioned, have made it really challenging for me to fully participate in the culinary aspects of travel. But that said, I've still had the chance to experience how meaningful food can be when it comes to learning about a culture. So I thought I'd share an example. I'm going to talk about Nepal again. Nepal, I had a really good experience with food because we spent a lot of time staying with a host family. Um, our trekking guide invited us into his home, and then we went to stay with his parents' family as well. And because we were with people that we trusted, I was able to eat a lot of food, which was really exciting for me. So while we were with our trekking guide's uh, parents, we learned that traditionally in some Nepalese communities, the matriarch of the household eats after everyone has finished their meal. And when this happened the first time, everyone was like kind of like reacting to it because Luke and I were like... Amma's not going to eat. We can't eat until Amma is eating as well. And they kept insisting like, no, no, no. Like, this is just how we do it here. Like, she oversees as everyone eats and refills plates until everyone is full. And then she will eat afterward. Um, so this is something about Nepalese culture that we were only able to learn because we ate with our host family. So yeah, it was an interesting experience because it gave us the chance to know and understand uh, cultural norms that like otherwise we definitely would not have been exposed to and have learned. I want to hand it over to you. Are there any food related experiences that you've had on your travels that were really conducive to learning about a culture? I think kind of the most obvious one uh, that really reflect that where the food and lifestyle kind of reflects who they are is uh, in Mongolia is very much eat to live instead of live to eat. You know, they're still nomading. I mean, not everybody, but, in, you know, I was spending time kind of like in the uh, the West, kind of outside of, of the capital city and stuff and going yurt to yurt. You're still seeing these people nomading, traveling with their herds and stuff. And so you'd see a goat out there, you know, in the morning, and then the head is on its plate in the afternoon. Um, <laughs> you know, they're just eating kind of basic stuff, the stuff that they have. Um, and they're doing it right, you know, they're, they're using every part of the animal and everything. And so, yeah, it just kind of reflects, I mean, just kind of what life is like, being an actual nomad and just traveling around kind of the desert, essentially. So yeah, that was really, really interesting. And just interesting to be in a culture that lives their life. That's the eat to live versus the live to eat. I'm very much accustomed and enjoy the eating to, or other way around, the living to eat way of doing things. Um, and so that was really, really interesting. Um, you know, they make their own cheese and it's like drying in the sun. And uh, yeah, just really, really interesting. And then just kind of 
understanding certain customs, like uh, in China and I think in Japan, um, slurping is considered to be, you know, telling the chef that, you know, it's really delicious. And when I first got to China, I went alone and I was just hearing the slurping sounds and, I, you know, it's just kind of like ugh, cringing all the time because <laughs> I was raised that that is very impolite yeah, and don't yeah. do that. And I was just getting like so upset. And then I finally learned that it is, yeah, to show respect and that they are enjoying the food. And I was like, oh, okay. And then it just, everything got like easier from there because I was just kind of on edge all the time hearing that noise. And for certain things, like I do try to adapt and and stuff. That one I couldn't. It was too much unlearning that I had to do to be slurping my, <laughs> my food. Uh, but uh, it was really, really helpful in making my experience much more enjoyable because I just didn't understand why it was happening. That's so funny. Last time Luke and I were in Japan earlier this year, he like really got on board with the slurping. Like he would just slurp so intensely. <laughs> he loved it. <laughs> did, he, did he continue on with it afterwards? Like since coming home, we haven't gone yeah. out for ramen. So I'm going to take him up for ramen and see what happens. And just see how many people are like, oh, and how many yeah. people are like, give me this yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so interesting, the point about Mongolia, because like it really shows how eating for pleasure in many like scenarios can be a privilege. So yeah, cultural learning is one important way that food contributes to the travel experience. But are there other ways that you would say food can shape or enrich our travels, um, things that you've experienced yourself? I think the biggest thing for me that food does is it just it brings people together. Um, and so like it starts conversations, it opens people up uh, and it's yeah, it's a really good icebreaker. And whether it's like a family dinner at a hostel, just like with other travelers or, you know, kind of on the opposite end, you know, where you're going to your guide's parents' home and experiencing that because um, you're, you're getting to experience the food, but kind of overall getting to interact with locals and, and things like that. Um, yeah. Going to markets and talking to people that way. Like I've played charades kind of being like, you know, I want this thing. Um, and they have to show me on the calculator, like how much it costs and, and everything. And uh, just, yeah, just like a fun experience. Um, I took the Trans-Siberian across Russia and everyone says, you know, make sure to bring extra vodka and extra food, <laughs> like more food than you're going to eat um, because you're going to share with everybody. And so, yeah, you just, you share with everybody and talk and Again, lots of charades happening. Who cares? Uh, you just kind of both take from the conversation whatever you think that you took <laughs> away. Um, but yeah, for me, it's even more than the actual food itself is kind of um, how people interact with it and around it, um, around the dinner table, around whatever. Um, uh, it really just, I think, brings people together and opens up conversations. Definitely. Like you actually got me thinking about the fact that a lot of the interactions that Luke and I have had, like especially with local people have happened because we sat down in a random like little hole in the wall restaurant and someone started chatting with us. Like it, it does lead to a lot of interaction. And like, this is a nice thing about Luke being a foodie, like in a lot of scenarios, I don't eat, but I tag along with him whenever he'll go and eat like street food or whatever when we're traveling. So I get to like have the experience through him. But yeah, it's so true. Like it does lead to so much like human connection and interaction. And then the other thing I was going to add, like that I've experienced is just learning things about food abroad. Like we often bring that home. And that's partly because I can't eat a lot of the things that we eat abroad. Um, when we get home, like Luke will make it for me. Like actually Luke makes me Korean food all the time because I'm too scared to like go to a Korean restaurant. So he just makes it at home so that I can experience it um, safely. So yeah, we take a lot of like the traditional foods that we eat abroad and then try to make them at home. They're never as good, but like we try. <laughs> you reminded me of... Um... When I visited my family in Denmark for the first time when I was 12 years old, I have like an imprinted memory of all it. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but in Denmark, open face sandwiches are a big thing. So this is an imprinted memory for me, which was all of us, my aunt and uncle, my parents and my cousins, all sitting around a table kind of building our open face sandwiches together with all of these different things. Yeah. That's such an imprinted memory of Danish culture and my family kind of being sucked into my life. I love an open face sandwich. 
Love it. Who doesn't? Although, is it a sandwich if it's not, if it doesn't have This is not that kind of podcast, Katie. Um, that's a good poll for this episode. <laughs> okay, so there's one thing that we have to talk about. I think this is like really important to touch on because I have heard people frame food that is different from what they are used to as gross. This always rubs me the wrong way because I feel like it just veers into like straight up racist territory sometimes. Our perceptions of what food is normal are totally shaped by our own culture's norms. Um, So yeah, it's something that I have encountered on my travels. I'm curious if you've encountered this kind of behavior uh, with other travelers or like people that you've like talked to even at home. And I'm curious like if you have any ideas around how we can challenge this notion, how we can talk to people about like what's wrong with framing food that way. Yeah, so... I have more run into people saying things are weird um, and not weird in the the fun way, like weird in a very microaggression. Uh, And and sometimes, yeah, people will use that and not even realize that it is such a strong microaggression. Food might be weird or anything might be weird to you, but that doesn't make it weird. And sometimes it's not even the words. It's kind of the scrunching of the face and the nose and, and everything. And so when people say weird, I just say I just say that like, oh, that's not weird or that might be, you know, kind of the same thing Um, and not in like an aggressive way. But I think people just need to be mindful because it's okay not to like everything. Like that's not the point, but you just have to be really careful about what you say, because whether you're talking to another traveler who might go try or not try it because you've decided you've told them that it's like weird or gross, um, maybe they don't try it at all. And it's something that they would have loved, or they kind of go into it with preconceived notions. Or, you know, you go home and you tell all these people like, oh, I was in X country and this thing or their food, like smelled weird, tasted weird, um, any of those things, like those people are going to walk away from this conversation thinking that the food from, you know, that country is that way because they don't have any other frame of reference. And so instead of using things that are different to be weird, you know, say interesting and just kind of be really mindful of the language that you use because it it really does make uh, a difference. Mm -hmm. Like you can literally just swap it for like different or new or interesting, like all these words that don't carry the same, like, I guess, like ethnocentric connotation with them. I will venture so far to say that I think even in any food that you don't like necessarily, like you can always point out something you do like about it. Like maybe you could say, I really like the crunch, but the texture is not for me. The la- like the the flavor is not for me, or you can just say it's not for you in particular. But I think once we start to say like the the food from this place and we generalize it all, that's when it definitely gets very problematic. that's a great point. Thank you. (laughs) I try to be like, I like the crunch or I like the spice or I like the flavor, but this part isn't quite for me. I don't think I'll be eating any more of that for a little while. (laughs) I'm a big textures person, so I get that. Yeah. Same. (laughs) Same. But it is really just like what has been normalized for you. Like we make food with like really specific textures in the West and like the rest of the world does it differently. And that's like totally normal and okay. Well, and I know I've heard a lot, um, children of immigrants, uh, have problems going to school, taking their lunches and stuff and kids and kids being like, ew, that's gross or, or whatever. And, uh, really makes, leaves a mark on people for like a lifetime. (laughs) Yeah. And it's so sad because like a lot of the time I find like the food that is framed this way is like food that like deserves to be celebrated. It's like really like wonderful traditions of food and like they just get ripped apart. It's really unfortunate. I have been guilty of of this in the past. I uh, was offered pig's blood and scrunched my nose. I was like, (laughs) oh, okay. Uh, But I tried it anyway. And I am happy to report that I went, this is before I was vegetarian. Uh, I'm happy to report that I went back in for a second oh. bite. Um, yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. And I was very happy that I, I tried it. And everybody there, this is in Lao, everybody there was like so excited that we tried it and uh, and even that we that we liked it. And so it just, you know, changed the, the whole vibe. And, you know, like if you have it again or go somewhere else and you can talk to other locals about it, like, oh, I tried this thing. Then they get excited. You know, you don't have to eat it again necessarily, but it, they get excited to hear about your experience with it. 
I love that point because I've also noticed this traveling is that like talking about a local food is such a compliment. Like when you're chatting with other people, like in Georgia, every time we would talk with a Georgian and we like were finding, like figuring out what we should say, our go-to is always to be like, we love Kinkali, which are the soup dumplings that are so popular in Georgia. And we would just go on and on about how we eat like 20 Kinkali a day, which was true. And it just led to like the funnest conversations because people would just (laughs) love it so much that we were so obsessed with Kinkali. It just makes for like a great way to like compliment a culture and yeah, celebrate people's food cultures. I want to ask you both a tough question, which is like thinking about reversing the tables and having a conversation around like American food is gross. North American food is gross. Like, let's be real. North America is the land of the beige food mostly. And I'm sure there's a ton of people from other cultures around the world who are like, ugh. (laughs) And like, I think there's framing of American food specifically too, I think in different parts of America where there's been a lot of slavery history and like kind of food that has been within these communities for a long time. Um, I think it's something that a lot of folks can think about at home too. I'm curious your thoughts, if you've ever encountered people while you're traveling being like, oh, you don't have any good food at home or whatever that might be. I've definitely encountered people saying that to me before. Yeah, I think food from the US uh, can definitely get a bad rap. Kind of when I'm explaining, trying to be like proud of the food. Uh, I definitely talk a lot about Southern food, which I actually don't know that much about, but there is, uh, like Katie, you were mentioning the... uh, history, you know, and the slavery and stuff. And there's just so many different cultures that come together to, to kind of create that. There's another issue around food and travel that I wanted to bring up just because like, it's very top of mind for me right now, because of our recent trip to Iceland. Um, so while we were there, we did a whale watching tour with an awesome company. They're really dedicated to responsible whale watching. Um, and so the tour was very education focused. And a big point that they continued to emphasize throughout it was that tourists should not be eating whale or puffin in Iceland. They emphasized to us that Icelandic people do not eat whale or puffin. There is an industry that's built up around providing this as like a spectacle of food for tourists. Um, So tourists are in Iceland. They want to eat something like exotic, quote unquote. And that's like as exotic as you can get in Iceland. Um, There is a history of Icelandic people eating these things, but like they do not anymore. They're really only on menus for tourists. So I thought this was really interesting because like, I know that there's other places I've been around the world where this is a thing where there's a food that like tourists are eating, but it's not actually like commonly eaten anymore. And it could have like conservation implications, like in the case of whale, like we should not be eating whales, like we should be protecting them at this stage. So yeah, I'm curious, like if you have any thoughts about this, if you've encountered this yourself traveling, like any foods that you're like, oh, this is literally just on this menu for a tourist. And if you have any ideas about how we can counter this, like obviously we should just stop eating these foods as tourists, but yeah, curious your thoughts. Yeah, actually in Iceland, uh, I don't know if shark is the same thing where they're talking about people eating sharks and stuff as well. I, in Peru, kui, which is guinea pig, um, I definitely, I mean, that is part traditionally of like Indian culture. You know, more and more stuff is available to them that they're not going to um, kui or, uh, these days. And so I think a lot of it is geared tor- towards tourism. And, you know, in like Red Lobster, where there's like the tank of lobsters in the in the lobby, like I did see a place that had like a thing of guinea <gasps> pig there. Yeah. Oh, I, why does it hit different when it's guinea pig? This is the thing. It's so because hard. Because it's not normal for like, us. Because they're like fluffy. I know. And, and they're cute. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that one was rough. Well, and also Kui is, is um, to make sure that you're actually getting a guinea pig and not uh, just like a rat or something. It has to come with the, the teeth in it. And so it's all, you know, it's like a huge kind of thing on Instagram as well, where people are like, oh, like I'm eating this thing. And it, it's the whole thing because again otherwise it could just be kind of any kind of street meat or or whatever um and so kui for sure um i don't know in japan if they're still doing the the puffer fish they are i saw it in markets yeah 
But I don't know, like with all of these animals, it becomes a question of like, are there conservation concerns around it? That's yeah. always what it boils down to for me. So like, I don't, I really don't know about puffer fish. And to be fair, like, I don't really know about guinea pig. Like maybe it isn't a conservation concern. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's something that kind of is a tradition today where it's like, oh, I'm going to go experience some of the culture and do this. And so now they're just like, I don't know if they're yeah raising the guinea pigs to be. That's the thing. Like, eaten. that's the crux of it for me is like, it's kind of like a manufactured cultural experience. Like it's not really right. a real cultural experience because it's not culturally practiced anymore. If it's something that is even more unusual than something that you don't just, something that's like unfamiliar to you, you're like, oh, a guinea pig. That is a little bit more unusual than the, the average kind of thing that I don't recognize. Uh, maybe I will do a little research into that. I know that's like extra work and stuff, but just giving it a, a really quick search on the internet, um, I think can solve that problem pretty easily. And by all means, be curious and, and try things that are new and, and different. But um, yeah, be mindful about it. Absolutely. We're all about a quick Google here on the podcast. Yep. Your mention of the rat just brought back a memory of mine, of being in Myanmar. And Lucas loves to eat. We were just walking by like a street food stand and there was were just like skewers of meat. And he bought one, starts eating it, and then turns to the person and says, well, what is this? It's really good. And they're like, it's rat. <laughs> so I guess he likes rat. Yeah. <laughs> did he finish it? I think he did. I can't really remember. He might have like gotten psychologically psyched out after that. I'm not sure. But because like different. But he's pretty good about that. Like he'll generally just eat anything. He doesn't really have the psychological block. Like the, I think the reason people think that I am vegetarian is because I have a major psychological block about eating animals. Like I need it to be fully disassociated. I cannot eat, like, this is why I don't like eating seafood. Like, it looks like seafood, and then I, I can't wrap my head around eating it. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is me with rabbit. I had a really hard time eating rabbit for the first time, mm -hmm. and I will not eat lamb because that was my favorite animal growing up, and I just, like, can't get past it. <laughs> so to wrap up, I have one final question. Um, so as we've mentioned, I cannot travel for food because of my allergies, and there's just too many restrictions around what I can eat. And this is not an abnormal experience. There are lots of people these days, not just people with allergies, but people who are celiac or vegan um, or even vegetarian who are facing the same challenge. So do you have advice for how people can engage with culinary experiences without eating the food or in a way that allows them to enjoy it, even if they have some restrictions that they're tackling? Yeah, I would say food tours are a good start because even if you're not going to eat the food, you are learning about it. You're getting the histories and the stories behind it because food tells a whole story about a country, whether it's a, a dish um, or just kind of showing the geography, the ingredients, um, all that stuff. Like you're going to get to learn a lot through that. And you'll have a guide who can give you suggestions for maybe an alternative place that you can go or, you know, in the very worst case has some just like good local restaurants um, where you can help support or, or, or whatever. But I think that's a really good resource where you're still getting, you know, great information, still visiting places, kind of like the origins of places. So like, um, like I don't like coffee, um, but every time I go to a Co big coffee producing country. I enjoy visiting kind of the the coffee plantations and seeing how it's done and seeing how it's made because it is uh, a huge driver in their economy and um, and that's interesting for me. Uh, you know, someone gets my cup of coffee, uh, so I make a new friend. And so you can still have these uh, experiences where you're learning about. It. I mean, like my whole podcast is talking about food without getting to actually like eat the food. Yeah, you're still getting to learn the experience and and um, understand a culture. Uh, on a deeper level. And I also think, you know, as long as you're not, if it's not for um, like ethical reasons and stuff, you know, you can enjoy going to like a mozzarella factory or the production places where you're still learning how things are produced um, because there's a lot of value in kind of learning where stuff comes from as well. And uh, if you're into that, I think it can be super interesting even without necessarily trying it. I love that. That's such a good point. And we do that a lot. Actually, very ironically, I once went to a peanut factory. <laughs> How? How In did me you do my, that? I was on a walking tour and I didn't know that we were going there. <laughs> I would have had 
such an anxiety attack. Yeah, I was scared. I was like, this is a little, a little too much. <laughs> Um, wow. Another one I'll add, though, that I've recently started doing, Luke and I did this a lot on our last like uh, long trip, cooking classes, because you get to learn how to make it and you make it in an environment where like you can work with someone and like inform them about your restrictions and they can usually like accommodate, especially if you let them know in advance. So that's been like a new thing I've been doing that's been really fun. So Katie, before we let you go, uh, where can people find you if they would like to follow you, read your work, listen to your podcast? So I'm on Instagram at Tasty Trails Travel Pod. It's a bit of a mouthful. (laughs) Um, And that's the same name of my podcast as well, which you can find on Spotify or anywhere that you listen to your podcast. So definitely, yeah, shoot me a DM, say, say hello, love to talk about food. Thanks for listening to Curious Tourism. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share it with a fellow traveler. Make sure you're following us and check for polls and questions under this episode on your favorite podcast app. If you're feeling extra generous, you can leave us a five-star review or support us on Patreon. Anything you can do to support the show will help foster meaningful change throughout the travel industry. Stay safe and don't forget to get travel medical insurance if you're hitting the road soon. I recommend Safety Wing and I've linked it in the show notes. Curious Tourism is written and hosted by me, Erin Hines, and it's produced and edited by Katie Lohr in Canada's Toronto area. If you want to reach out to us, check the show notes for all the info you need. Stay tuned for a new episode next month and of course, stay curious.